Welcome to Raising the Bar, the podcast that pulls back the curtain on the country's most successful leaders and how they elevate their business and their teams. Please welcome our host, Alison DePauli. Hey, thank you for joining us for the next episode of Raising the Bar, where we talk to CEOs who have raised the bar in their professional lives in some way. Today, it is my pleasure to introduce you to Dr. Elisa Hallerman, who is not our typical business owner guest. She runs a rather unique organization and has a rather unique history. And you know, I'm not one for bios, but I'm going to ask her to fully introduce herself and what she does to us. Thank you for joining me today, Elisa. Oh, thank you so much for having me, Alison. So I was a practicing attorney at one point many, many years ago after college, went straight to law school, practiced and did a lot of litigation, personal injury and real estate, and did that for about two years and decided this isn't for me. I don't want to be running around to all the five boroughs in Manhattan and around (laughs) New York City. I don't want to live in New York City. It's too cold. I don't want to marry this guy that I'm living with get me out of here, move to LA. So this is the early 90s, um, mid 90s. And before, you know, in the old days before the internet, and I got to Los Angeles and someone introduced me to the entertainment world and said, do you want to maybe get a job at a talent agency? And so I did that. I got a job at a talent agency and I started in the mailroom as an assistant, even though I was an attorney and was able to work my way up over the next 15 years to a partner and ran one of the talent departments at one of the largest agencies and had this big, beautiful career. I'd gotten sober from drugs and alcohol in in 2002, so 20 plus years ago. Mm -hmm. And after I'd gotten sober, I had a lot of quote unquote success in the entertainment industry. And and I say quote unquote success because at the time success meant to me more of the shiny new stuff outside of myself. The corner office, the title, the house, the car, whatever those things were that I had hoped and dreamed for and whatever more business looked like. And What started to happen is the longer that I was sober and the healthier I was getting, my outsides weren't matching up with my insides. And I hadn't done that deeper internal work. And I didn't do it because I didn't have to do it. I didn't, people would say sometimes, you need to do the inner work. And I was like, how do you, how do you get inside? Like I was a businesswoman and a lawyer and an intellectual thinker. And to me, doing the inside work felt a little esoteric and I didn't really know my way in. But when you start to get confronted with these little whispers in your life of, is this it? Is this what I'm doing? Am I happy? Do I like my job? And I'm finding more and more people are having these whispers, right? Mm -hmm. Especially after what we've experienced with lockdown and COVID and the pandemic that I had to listen to that, and that was 15 years ago, and really say to myself, what else is out there? Did you find that um, you didn't listen to the whispers until they sort of shouted at you or hit you over the head? Yeah, so I talk, yes, the answer is yes. I (laughs) feel uh, like maybe most people can understand that we hear these whispers, but they're such big questions that if we're just going through our day-to-day life and things are okay enough, right? We feel like we can just shush them away. And we do that until they get louder and louder and louder because I mean, I refer to them as soul whispers when I talk about the soul journey, but in the book, but, but really they'll get louder and louder and louder until a brick house falls on your head and you're forced to stand still and evaluate. Before we go any further, I do want to um, 
this is the book and it is remarkable and we will link uh to it in the show notes so you can get your own copy and everybody should read this book thank you thank you it was a little blurred because you have your blurred. Oh, yes i'm blurred so yeah but we'll do it in the show notes so <laughs> yeah yeah absolutely copy of this book because it is a remarkable book and a remarkable story i think of um not only listening to yourself but allowing people to help you on the way mm, thank you thank you for that so so when I started to hear the whispers louder and louder, I was confronting brick walls and large speed bumps and big moves that I needed to pivot. And there was a lot of sort of change that was going on for me. And for me, I think the the defining moment was I had um, one of my biggest clients had fired me and while I was still had this great big job, what it did was it caused me to have some time to think and to feel my reaction, which was in a lot of ways, I was relieved Mm -hmm. and I felt like I had this more space to look at myself. And that's when I started going back to school and taking classes at night Um, And I started learning about addiction and addiction medicine and neuroscience and trauma. And I was blown away by the amount of information. When I'd gotten sober, I had a therapist and I was part of 12 Step, but I didn't really understand the breadth of what was out there as far as treatment modalities and science and new information every day especially as it related to neuroscience. And so I started to think like, this is a big missing piece. And when I was an attorney, people would come to me for legal advice. And when I was an agent, people would come to me for career advice. And I thought, well, why doesn't it, why isn't there someone or a company where you can go to and get advice like you would get from your accountant on your taxes when you have a mental health issue and you just want to be able to say, Hey, here's what's going on for me right now. And now what, what exists? What don't I know? Because as we Google or we ask our neighbor or our best friend where this, their kid went or their best therapist, it's not always going to fit in exactly with our own unique experiences. Mm -hmm. And so that felt like a business I want to create. I wanted to create. So I went back to school, got my master's and doctorate in psychology, focusing on neuroscience and trauma, along with the addiction studies that I had already done, and then started this company, Recovering Management Agency, based off the blueprint of how I ran the talent department. (laughs) I think that's fascinating. I think it's such a good illustration of of learning one skill and applying it to another place, Mm -hmm. um, which I think is maybe not easier, but possible more often than people think. Mm-hmm. Um, where you, you learn this, but you can just pivot this over here and it's the same skill set. Yes. Um, I want to go back and talk about neuroscience and trauma a little bit. I think, you know, I live in South Texas, excuse me. And, and um, you know, besides the fact that we think we're our own country here, um, we are a little bit. You different. are a little. <laughs> yes, we are. <laughs> uh, but w- we tend to think, oh, tough it out. Just stick it up. Tough it up. You you can do it. And I think there has been so much research and new material in in psychology and how trauma affects people and when and how it affects people and and understanding that the effects of trauma can be lifelong. And um, that lands in employer workplaces. And I will tell you, I don't have a client that's not having a mental health challenge, not not the white collars, not the scientists, not the lawyers, not not the nurses, not the manufacturing folks, not the car folks, nobody. And that employers in blue collar industries are saying, we have a mental health problem. We need to help people manage themselves or understand how to manage themselves. And we need to interact with them better in South Texas is remarkable to me. It is truly remarkable. Um, 
you work not just with individuals and families, but you do work with employers as well. Correct. What is that experience like? How do you help employers help maybe an individual? Probably they would be most encountering this on a leadership team, but for their regular staff and for their culture as well. Exactly. So I look at employers as a different type of family system. Mm -hmm. And so if we're looking at it from the psychology of the family system, it's really, it's really no different. One person affects how the other people are doing their work and vice versa. There's a lot of, there's a lot of personalities and there needs to be a correct amount of communication and there needs to be common language and common understanding and they need to be educated on what different types of mental health or substance abuse or psychosis or trauma, what, what it looks like. And I think that's where we're really helpful. So I work a lot with um, a woman named Chris Grimm who has her own consulting company. And what we did was we partnered up so that we could go in and she really understands corporate consulting coaching. That is her bread and butter. And I really understand obviously this world of mental health and substance abuse and addiction and trauma. And together we were able to go into these companies and sort of sit down and do a full assessment with them as if they were a family. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we'll decide based on how big the company is and how many, you know, we'll do either something small. We've done 8,000 employee companies. It, it, it totally varies. And then when we have the gist of the information, we'll say, okay, this is how we would like to proceed with our assessment, but cross section, or maybe it's just leadership or C-suite or what have you. And we do a full assessment so that we can really understand the personality and the soul of the business. And then we will come back with, okay, here's what we think you need to be educated on. And also here's how we're going to do short and long-term planning as far as bringing this into the culture. Um, Do you, um, how do you, promote engagement into the assessment process? And what does the assessment process look like? It really looks different for each company, right? If you imagine just an individual or just a family system, and I think that everyone, regardless of where they work, has experienced some sort of mental health crisis or issue within their own immediate, if not one one generation over, right? So a company is no different. You really have to, where are they in, where are they in their ability to want to change and what that looks like? People, human beings, companies, no one wants to change. It's not comfortable. We're used to what we know, especially if it's a successful company, like this is what's working. This is what we need to keep doing. This doesn't fit in. And so we really have to first, that's why it's always about doing the assessments first to see what is going on underneath Mm -hmm. and where everybody is in their stage of change, because we're not looking to really change anything. We're looking to transform And what I like to say is we're looking to grow down. We're not looking to change what's working. We're looking to create more depth in what it is that you are doing Mm -hmm. and really caring for the other human beings and the people that are working at the company. Otherwise you are losing a tremendous amount of money. Yes. I I found, um, so our, I'm in the health insurance space and, and for our best and highest performing clients, I always get some version of, look, we spend a lot of money. If we can spend less, great, but that's not the point. 
could we help the humans? And I think a lot of employers are very concerned about their employees, staff, teams, people, whatever it is that you want to call them. Mm -hmm. They are very concerned. They do not know what to do or how to do it. And I think if you if you just say, well, you just need to heal everybody. Uh, that's too much. We can't too broad. We have a different conversation. How do you guide that conversation? So it's very specific as to what are they already doing? Some mm -hmm. companies will already have some sort of wellness protocol, but what I, what I notice is that it doesn't really in include behavioral health. Right. And so that's an important piece of what are they missing? What do they already have in place and what are they missing? And then there's, if there's a, it's a large company and there's HR, they have certain protocols already in place mm -hmm. where they have programs where just call this number. Well, when you call an EAP or you call a number and you're given X amount of sessions, let's say five sessions, what's happening is you're calling a company, you're speaking to whoever's answering the phone Mm -hmm. And they're saying, okay, you know, we're going to connect you with Dr. Sally or, you know, Jim, and they're going to be right for you. But they know nothing about the company, the kind of personality of the people that work there, mm -hmm. because each company is going to be so unique and specific. Just speaking about the entertainment business alone and working yeah. with those companies as opposed to maybe working with a Wall Street company, it's a different set of personalities. Mm -hmm. So I'm not going to suggest maybe the same type of therapist or the same kind of treatment, if you will, or even the same lecture or education that I'm gonna give them that I'm gonna give this company. So it mm -hmm. really, what we do is so specific not only in working with families and individuals, but with companies in the same exact way. How do you ensure that the message is delivered throughout the company? Um, you had mentioned earlier that that your largest client is about 8,000 employees. You know, I I often think that employee communication is is like, you know, the game of telephone when you were a child. And, you know, what somebody says here is, <laughs> comes out completely different on the other end. How do you manage that process? I mean, at some of the larger companies, it's everything from rewriting the copy of how the email is going to go out to the entire company or, you know, delivering an important piece of information and what that copy is going to look like. And are there any trigger words? And is this the right language? And explaining it, not just doing it for them, but teaching them. This is why, right? And so it can be as small as that to really figuring out, well, who are the sort of the superstars, if you will, not just the people, th those people that have these leadership roles, whether they're actually that partner or they're getting paid in that, but who are those leaders that people gravitate towards, that they want to listen to? And you know, let's start with some people. Let's really understand also what is going on at, we'll, get, we'll do a cross-section of interviews throughout the company to really understand what's going on throughout the company. We're not going to sit down with 8,000 people, but we're going to do a cross-section. Sure. And really understand what's going on and do a thorough evaluation and then be able to come back and say, okay, here's what we've learned here's where we are, here's where we need to get to, and here's how we think we can get there. And you can help monitor the progress along the way? Yeah, completely. Like we'll work, we'll set up a year long, this is how we're gonna roll it out, mm -hmm. a year long engagement with a company if need be. So I see a lot of um, issues where an employee is, not coming to work or uh, there's a lot of pre presenteeism because there's an issue in the family. How do you address those kinds of things? 
from a corporate level. If I'm your, if I, if I work for you and you see that all of a sudden there's a huge change in my performance and you suspect that there's something going on, I have a sick family member, there's some financial stress. What have you found are the most effective ways to address that that can accommodate an HR policy as well as accommodate the human? Mm -hmm. So, right, it's tricky at different Mm -hmm. different companies. I find that they need a third party. So the companies that we work with will often call and say, we're really worried about Bob. He, this is what's showing up and what, sh- what should we do? And usually my advice is somewhere in the reign of have a conversation, have HR present and offer Bob solution. We're concerned, we're worried, we don't know what to do. This is not our role, but we, we appreciate you. We respect you. We want to do what we can. We would like to offer you that we will work with RMA. We will hire them to do X amount of sessions or put something together. And we want to offer you solution. Here's the phone number, call her. It'll be strictly private. And then that's one way that we work really well mm-hmm. with companies because With HR, it is really tricky. I think, you know, if not my company, there needs to be someone that's a third party that's brought in that they can say, listen, we're willing to pay for this, but we're going to let them decide with you what's appropriate or what you need, um, I think is really the the best way to go. So it shows that they care that they're concerned, that they're willing to take on some of the financial, the financial piece of it, but mm-hmm. they're also giving you autonomy, giving the employee autonomy to decide what they want to do. But like in a family system, the parents have to be willing to have boundaries and consequences. The parents can't tell their 19 year old kid, their 35 year old kid, that this is what they have to do because they're over the age of 18, but they can certainly say, here's what we're willing to do for you and participate and be there for you and financially and emotionally support you. Here's what we're not willing to do. Mm -hmm. And how, um, I think your business is growing quite rapidly and more and more people are finding their way to you. Are there any consistent themes that you see that people come to you for? I think that what I'm noticing, what I've noticed the most over the last couple of years since the pandemic is the rate of depression and the suicidal ideation. That is like nothing I've ever seen. The the fact that suicide is a very real choice for so many people is devastating and they're in the the system the mental health system is so broken and getting someone help who is suicidal is almost impossible at times in certain states and that even with the increase in suicidal awareness or 988 the the actual treatment on the other end of that is not accessible we don't have mental health facilities in the way that we used to. We have a lot of substance abuse and co-occurring treatment centers. Mm -hmm. But if someone has is experiencing psychosis or someone is experiencing suicidal or homicidal, you know, um, thoughts, to be able to get them into a mental health facility, there are very few beds. 
in the hospitals that we have. And we we went through a period where we closed a lot of those facilities. So it's there's literally nowhere to put them. And because it's such a big problem, being able to intervene and having early, and I think this is where companies can come in, as we saw this progression of depression and anxiety, and even going back, I remember when the Me, when the Me Too had really started and companies were coming with, well, what do we do? What do we do about this? And I was like, you know, wouldn't it have been nice? Because none of these were complete shocks. I mean, maybe some, but most, there were red flags that we were painting white along the way and looking the other way. Yep. Because, but if we could get ahead of that, if we could get ahead of the depression, if we get ahead of the anxiety, if we could make it a place where they felt comfortable, maybe saying, hey, is there someone I can call? Is there something I can do? And we can just offer that and get ahead of it a little before it becomes that crisis. Or if their kid is having that crisis, that they can call their office, their company that they worked at for 30 years every day, right? And say, hey, wh who do I call? And you what can have on hand some real places. Like that's an incredible gift and, and not that hard. Not that hard. So, not that hard to have some tangible here resources. resources that are not just online, but can I have someone to speak to for an hour and get clear clarity? Do you feel that I've seen organizations that never stopped working? They, they worked right on through the pandemic and just kept okay. right on going and, and really didn't miss a work beat. The people missed a lot of beats, but the, the work kept going. And, and I still have clients that everybody is now remote and they're all seemingly quite happy. But do you feel that the stigma of mental health issues is relaxing just a little bit? Because looking from the outside, I always feel that there are not good resources for people when there's maybe a small ideation or a concern or a concern about a family member until there's a full blown crisis. And then it's almost like when you go to jail and at this point, if you go to jail, your life is pretty much over. Is that relaxing a little bit? Is the stigma going away a little bit? Maybe a little bit, but it's still not a comfortable topic to be certainly in the workplace where mm -hmm. people feel they can share with their colleagues or certainly their bosses or even HR. There's not, we haven't, we haven't gotten there yet for sure. I don't, we certainly haven't here in Texas, but you know, we're our own country here. So, uh, but I, I see that. LA point. maybe, I you know I live in LA, maybe in LA it's a little bit more accepting, but I'd say for the majority, yeah, it's, it's, it's incredibly difficult. It's incredibly difficult. Do you have any, what do you, I see more than ever before mistrust in the workplace. Maybe I'm naive or, or maybe I never looked at it the right way, but I, I used to see a lot of workplaces that were relatively pe peaceable and, and people got along and people weren't, weren't actively thinking that somebody was working against them. And, you know, I'm not talking about paranoia, but there seems to be a lot more conflict in the workplace and a lot more distrust among levels of people and not just oh that's the man it 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 seems to be coming the other way as well and that seems to me to be a little different than it was a few years ago are you encountering that i what that looks like to me is unresolved trauma and stress and toxic stress mm -hmm. and so when we're in a fight or flight, when we're triggered, then yeah, we're going to go into this, you know, it's eat or be eaten. It's, it's me or you. There's no, and that is a very reptilian old brain reaction to survival. And I think most people are 
their window of tolerance of what they can endure is getting smaller and smaller because of the stress that they're under and yeah. because of the trauma that either individually has happened to them in the last couple of years or just what's happening in the world. And if we're not working on that, if we're not healing that, then everyone's window and window of tolerance is getting smaller. Everyone's ability to self-regulate is getting shorter and everybody is in survival of fight or flight or this is mine and that is yours and I need to protect it at all costs. And the way that that manifests itself is in this backstabbing, you know, unsupportive, dishonest mm -hmm. culture. It's not even about the culture. It's about the trauma. Yep. So how do you... If I'm an individual and I and I go to work every day, how do I how do I regulate myself in that environment? And if I am a leader, maybe maybe not a C-suite leader, maybe a mid-level leader, you know, that kind of mid-level, low senior level leader, because those are the those are the operational people, right? Sure. How do I manage that? How do I how do I what is a good framework for thinking about how to manage that? on an on on a kind of low key basis and maybe that's too broad a question but resources are hard sometimes and not everybody is going to have access to a full team of people that can help with that but the problem yeah. still exists i think that um it is broad but if we're just looking at some selective things that everybody could do i think it's about identifying when someone is in a trauma response or when someone seems to be suffering from physical signs of maybe addiction or a mental health crisis or trauma. So, right, they might have a lack of concentration. Mm -hmm. They might be excessively sweating. They might be you know, talking really, really quickly. They might feel dissociated. They might not be paying attention in, in, in the same way. They mm -hmm. might be very forgetful of something that, you know, was told to them last week. They might be inconsistent in the way that they're ir irritable or they're having a mood swing, or they're isolating a little bit more when you don't see them with maybe their traditional crowd that they run with. And really being able to notice not what people say, but what people do. Mm -hmm. And if someone's elevated or they're in, it's, it's taking that, you know, let's take 10 minutes and go back to our offices and settle and come back and have this conversation or let's wait 24 hours and have this conversation tomorrow. And just giving some space. What happens is when I talk about window of tolerance, you know, that, that, that is a word that Dan Siegel um, speaks about when he's talking about trauma and what happens in our body. And so our bodies are meant to self-regulate, right? So, something will happen and we'll have this moment of right where maybe we're walking on the sidewalk and we see a garden hose and we jump because we think it's a snake and that is our survival part of our brain and then very quickly the front part of our brain the cognitive thought process our impulse control rational thinking comes online and goes no no we've seen that before that's a garden hose garden we're hose. fine and so you go you know, our bodies go up in this elevation and then they come back down. And when something happens that's outside of that window of tolerance, where it's too extreme, where we can't compute what's happening, or there's been chronic trauma, you have a narcissistic boss that is saying certain things and you come from a family of emotional and physical abuse, that's gonna land much higher in salience of how mm -hmm. you feel it than it might for your your coworker. So for everybody to be cognizant about what these 
sort of signs look like when someone's activated or when someone is dissociated or when someone is having symptoms of withdrawal or drug use or whatever. I think that is, that's something that as long as you can notice in real time and kind of shut that down in the moment, that's really helpful. So retreat and re come back to it again another day. Another day or give it some space. So, or bring someone else in the room to maybe make them feel safe. People that are traumatized feel they don't feel safe in their surrounding. And so their immediate reaction is, I'm going to fight back or I have to get the F out of here. Yep. And so when we see that kind of a response, it's maybe take a little bit of time, maybe bring in a third party that they are going to feel comfortable into the room. And it doesn't feel like, an attack and create a safer space. Maybe get out of the office environment and take a walk around the block to have the conversation. Before we wrap up, um, one thing that I have been uh, reading about is that trauma is cumulative and there, ha there may be things that happened in the past and something will trigger it in the present, even though it doesn't seem that serious a thing. Is that, is that a correct assessment? So trauma, when someone's experiencing trauma symptoms, there's three different kinds of trauma. There's an acute trauma, which is an accident or an assault, a one-time event. Mm -hmm. So things that we think of as traumatic mostly. Then there's chronic trauma, which is ongoing. Someone being bullied at school, someone working for a boss that is consistently triggering them and triggering them and triggering them, um, going through a divorce over a period of a year, ongoing things that are going on and on. And that's building up to the same amount of trauma as an acute event would. And then okay. there's complex trauma, which would be a combination of both and also a lot of underlying childhood trauma attachment disorder stuff and so on. And so what happens is the way we define trauma, and this is different from PTSD, is it's not about the event itself that's happened whenever, long ago. Mm -hmm. It's about how our body is responding to it in the present, not being able to stay in the present because we're experiencing the present moment as if we are still activated in that trauma response. So it's not able to move forward. What happens is something traumatic happens. And mm -hmm. like I said, you want to go into fight or flight. Well, what if you can't? What if you're frozen? What if you're unable? So two things happen. One is all that energy and all that adrenaline and cortisol that gets immediately pumped through your body gets held on a cellular level that we haven't been able to disperse. Mm -hmm. So that will manifest itself as anxiety, OCD behavior, things like that, phonetic energy, shutdown. And that's what's happening in our bodies. What's happening in our brains is that when something traumatic happens, we're unable to integrate that experience. So you'll hear people talk about they were in a car accident and things slowed down. Yep. And, or when they're talking about something that had happened to them that was traumatic, it's bits and pieces that don't make sense. Like when you talk about a dream the next morning mm -hmm. and that's because everything can't get integrated because your brain only understands something that's happened before. And, all of a sudden something outside of our realm of understanding a sudden death we're like what wait what what you're still you're like, you can't understand what's happening so your memories don't get integrated so you lose a sense of time so it's happening to you on a neurological level and it's happening to you on a physiological level and that trauma that energy does get coupled on top of each other until you start to heal what's happened. The good news about trauma is it can be healed, unlike some sort of mental health issue or mental illness or substance abuse mm -hmm. where it requires abstinence or medication or therapy, right? And ongoing. 
you can really release and heal a lot of your trauma. And I think we will leave it there and that that was very good advice for very many people, including those that think they're not traumatized. No judgment there. So thank you very much. No judgment anyway. No room for judgment. (laughs) (laughs) Also very good advice. Um, Thank you for joining me today. And for those of you that are listening, thank you very much for listening. Um, If you like the show, leave us a review, subscribe wherever you're listening to this. And it helps us spread the word and we will see you next time. Thanks so much. Thank you. We hope you've enjoyed this episode. Raising the Bar is powered by Altic Consulting, the country's leading independent expert in healthcare cost containment. Astute employers know there's a better way to offer health insurance and we help them achieve it.